Well, Michael or Mick, which do you prefer? My mother loves Michael. <laughs> <laughs> they call me Mick, Mike, and everything, uh, don't they? I, I answer to everything, really. <laughs> I just want to ask you straight away, Michael, like, when you were playing football, what, what was the thing you loved most about playing football? What was the best bit of it? It was the freedom that, you know, when I was a kid, you know, to get out the gutter, you had to, you know, you had to play football. We played football from, you know, from when we got up in the morning. You know, education was, was very, very a long way back, if you know what I mean. You know, I'm, I'm a lad that's, that was self-educated. You know, I, I could play football, but I couldn't read or write. You know, being dyslexic didn't help either. You know, it, it, uh, it sort of pushed you, pushed you back in further and further back. But, hey, I was lucky. I had a, a great mum and dad who absolutely worshipped all three of us, you know, and um, three boys that, that, that she had. And, and um, you know, when we lost my eldest brother, you know, like, and I moved to Southampton to play football. Like, it was like a, a lifeline for the family, you know, and, and, and we all sort of jumped on the bandwagon and, you know, we, we lived the dream. You know, I was a footballer. I was very lucky and, you know, like I say, I had parents that were absolutely brilliant to me and, and you know, and my brother. And uh, he's a very successful greengrocer. He works, he's got his own shop, you know. Um, he's got a he's got a large family, and you know, I mean, he's very successful as well. But we've all been hard workers. We came from a place called Orchester in Salisbury Plain. Um, we were, I was brought up there, and Elsie was brought up just down the road at uh, Netherhaven, and and Richard Allen was at Everly. Just we're all within four miles of each other. So, you so know, there's three, bad boys there's, together. There's three train <laughs> three trainers that have trained, you know, well over two thousand winners. Mm. And, you know, within f four or five miles in Wiltshire. It's quite amazing, really, when you think about it. I'm interested in those, those early football days, though, Michael. Like, when you had a ball at your feet, was that when you were sort of in your comfort zone, when you were most happy? Well, I think it was. But, listen, it, you know, when I look back now, like I was the, the star player in our team, you know. What I'm saying is, oh, give it to Shannon, he, he'll do something with it. And that was the luxury I had. They gave it me the, me the ball, and I usually lost it. Did you enjoy that? But I was that a good feeling? But, oh, yeah. it was, I mean, that was, it, it was motivating, wasn't it? If they thought, thought you were the best, and they gave you the ball, you had more chance of scoring goals or making things happen. Because when you look at your Messi's and your, your Ronaldo's and all the great players, you know, that um, you know, I was fortunate enough to play against, you know, the Pelés and, of this world and, and Maradona's. You know, I played against them. I didn't play with them. But they were they were great players, you know, and um, you know that, that is exactly the same. If you're the best at, at doing something, you, you know you want to load the gun, yeah. you know, because yeah. he'll fire the bullets and he'll win the game for you. Yeah. And and really, that's what you know. That's what I was. I mean, all the time I was very fortunate that I I was I had a lot of bags of speed. I you know one thing I had was I was quick, yeah. um, you know and. And I had a very good tutor in the, w w Terry Payne, who was a great player at Southampton. I was lucky I played with some other great players there. But Terry Payne was, was, was brilliant. He could see things happening before they could. And I was quick. I saw space, and he used to just deliver the ball. And that's where the, the windmill came from, you know? Yeah. And, and you remember you, the first time you did that? No, I can't. I can't remember. But normally... As I said, in those days, we, Southampton, you know, the first game of the season, you know, on the news channel, they used to say, another relegation battle at the Dell. Yeah. You know, that was the, that was the, and this was the first game of the season. That's how the reporters thought, that's what they thought of us. Because when you won the FA Cup, didn't you get relegated the same season? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got relegated the season before. Right. And they, he kept the team together, which was a lot of experienced players. Mm. Your Osgoods and, Jim, uh, you know, Jimmy McCalliogs and um, Peter Rodriguez. We had a lot of very good players. Why were you so loyal to Southampton? Because clearly you could have moved... It was a way of life. That's what I'm trying to say. Is it, it was not like football today. Bosman Rulands changed everything. You know, the most I ever earned in my life was 500 quid a week playing football. The people look at that, they'd laugh now. 500 quid a week. 
playing but there football. There was money around. Weren't you transferred for 300 grand once? I was, time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was. I went to Man City. For, I, w I held the record for three days. Then, then uh, Celtic sold uh, <laughs> Del Glish to Liverpool for 400 grand. <laughs> so I held it at 300 for four days. I but think in those it days, it clearly didn't feed down no, to you. No, because it, before Bosman ruling, all you got was 5%. Right. All you were entitled. And, it, you know, if, if I, and you weren't able to move, the Bosman ruling was what changed everything. Because once your contract was up, you were a free agent. Did you, did you mind? Like... You obviously knew you were a world-class footballer, but, that, but you weren't earning millions. Did at that time did you ever think like that, or, no. or do people only think like that we now? Never th we never thought. I mean, you can go back to all the all those great players, your Stanley Matthews and your Finneys and that. They, they were playing for they were playing for two bob. Yeah, they were playing for nothing. You know, so we thought we were. You know, the progression. The it was the Bosman ruling. One thing changed football, the Bosman ruling. Once you became a free agent. See, and what players get now is not wages, it's what their value is mm. over the next four or five years. That's, you know, so if, some, if somebody says, oh, you know... Well, would you have put, put a figure on what you think your value was <laughs> then well, in I, today's I, terms? What do you think Shannon would go for? I think he'd go for 50 mil. <laughs> Only 50 mil. <laughs> Cheap. 60 Cheap. If you, it's a bargain. 60 if you want extra windmills. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> yeah. It's a bargain. Here we've got proper footy stuff. Talk us through this, this line of players. Now, you start there with Martin Peters on that end. Yeah. Peter Storey. Yeah. Played for Arsenal. Bobby Moore, the great Bobby Moore. Wow. Um, and that's uh, Roy McFarland, Schiltz, Peter Schiltz, myself, Martin Peters, and the great Alan Ball. That cap, see, there's three, there's three names on that, Wales, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The home internationals, you'd get one cap with all the three names on if you played in the games. And that was the games. That they, I think that's the famous game when they, when they dug the Wembley up, didn't they? Oh, right. Yeah. When you look at these pictures, Mike, does it, does it feel like a different world? Can you, can you remember standing in that row of people at all? No, I can't, I can't remember it one little bit. I remember sort of, I remember the feeling of it, but... You know, I've, I've played 40 odd times, so 46 times or something. And so I've been out there, and I remember going out there. I remember going up the tunnel, the old tunnel, you go up there, and you didn't hear a thing when you were down the bottom. As soon as you got to the top, and you walked in, then you had Wembley. Then you the feel roar, that? the crowd, you, you know, it? It, was, it was something Does it special. Does it really get you? Oh, yeah, it, it makes. When makes you sing the national anthem, is that up, special? Even your hair stand up. So look, you became a hero at Southampton. You were here at Norwich as well. One or two places elsewhere. In between. You must have had great fun along the uh, way. But Give it, us, tell us some footy stories, Mick. Well, That's I, what I we want to hear. Tell well, us some things that happened with your friends at that time. Well, there were, you know, I mean, my big mate was, my mates were sort of Keegan and Ball. Um, you know, were my main, were, would be the, the big mate, Brian O'Neill. I had lots of great times with Ball. He used to, we used to do a, a television program, Shannon and Ball. Oh yeah, of course. You know, yeah. going back, you know, when we used to, uh, that used to be the. I did forget. you enjoy that? Yeah, I did. I did a lot of television, but not like you. I, I, what I'm <laughs> you trying mean to say is. It was entertaining. Is, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I enjoyed television, but a lot. You know, there's a lot of hanging around. It used to bore the <laughs> off, you know. I mean, I had some great days it, with Brian Clough, for example, you know, and Cloughy, we used to do the, we, we were, we used to, but we only come on about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night to do the World Cup previews and, you know, what I'm saying is the games that had gone in the afternoon. And in them days, you had to watch the, we used to be in the Dorchester. Right. We used to meet in the Dorchester and I remember him bringing Nigel Clough and what have you. And we're sat there watching, we watched the game there. Then we had to go to the studios. At, LWT, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, London Weekend. And then, you know, but Brian was a lovely man. Absolute, a bit like yourself, you know, absolute smashing chap till he'd put the camera on you. <laughs> and then you're a monster, you know. <laughs> and then if, if he was on fire then, I'd dial 998, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, but Cloughy was, he was lovely all afternoon and, and he had Nigel there and he was, 
and we had dinner, and we, you know, we, then we had sandwiches in the evening, tea, then we went to the game at night, which was, wasn't on until about half ten. And as soon as they come on, young man, you don't know what you're talking about, he used to say. <laughs> and you go, oh, and it just shocked you, you know, yeah. he was such a character, but such a lovely man. Yeah. And, and, and we only saw, like, when he was a manager, he was a very good manager. He probably never to get the, the England job, when you think about it. You know, kind of think he would have been great, tough, though. But a he? great man, man manager, yeah. Was Clough to managing a bit like Sir Mark Prescott to training, do you think? Yeah, well, I think, I, I mean, as he's just told the whole world. Oh, I yeah, sent when, him, when I sent him, won the Ark. When he won the Ark, I sent him a telegram. Lucky f***. <laughs> <laughs> This looks like the ca a good cabinet. I'm interested in this. Well, this is Michael's cabinet almost. <laughs> <laughs> what are the footballs for? Yeah, the footballs are, are basically footballs that he managed to save because I don't know what, what happened to them, but they were all balls that I that we scored, won a hat trick with. It's all, it's all half, you know, there's all signatured. Oh, almost lost James Mead here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all signatured. All these are. Um, so so these morning. are banged in hatches. And that's, a, that's the milk cup that, at Norwich. That's the milk cup. That's all we got then in them days. I bet you were delighted with that back then, though. I think, we, yeah, I think we got better. This eight, is Southampton Football from. Club yeah. Player of the Year. Yeah. yeah. Shannon, 1973 <laughs> to 74. Yeah. And there's some boots. Look, the, look at them. Can't even afford, afford the studs now. Tell me, were you naughty? as footballers? Not on the day of the game, no. I remember the Desert Orchid days with David Ellsworth and Bawley and that. We used to leave, we used to leave home on, on a Thursday morning. And I said, we, you know, we used to go straight to training on the fr Friday morning, you know, because we, we'd usually go to Wincanton. Right. You know, Desert Orchid invariably won there or, or one of Elsie's horses. We'd have lunch there and we probably never got home. I'm, I'm interested in the kind of atmosphere, just from the point of view, like, the impression I have at the moment is, say, the England players get on the team bus, they all put their headphones on and listen to their music or play their games or whatever. You wouldn't have had any of that in their day. When you got on the team bus, I'm presuming you, you talked or you chatted or you had a laugh or... Oh, oh I think... I think in our day, I think the banter was, was just the same as it probably is today, but it, it was a little bit more, what can I say... Risqué? Yeah, probably, you know. Um, I remember meeting with England at Newbury here um, with Keegan, and we had a horse running at uh, Devon and Exeter, and me and Keegan went to Devon and Exeter, saw the horse. I think it finished second and got, didn't win. We, and we came back to the hotel for, for evening tea. But, you know, what I'm trying to say is we had a lot more freedom than they did today, let's put it that way. That's where we were fortunate. Yeah. We, weren't, we weren't followed by the press or the media. You know, if you, you know, but we, we were lucky. We had a great life in the sense that uh, you know we could go and have a drink. We could, you know, you know, we could we could go and back horses. I mean, <laughs> if if that was being naughty, yes, we were naughty. But we had we lived a great life. Just final thing on the football. Um, you became an England legend. You scored loads of goals for England. I think you still hold the record as the most caps without actually ever playing at a World Cup. Yeah, I think I think that's not a pr nothing I'm proud of. But no, uh, but that wasn't your fault though. The no, team no. just didn't qualify. We didn't, well, we were in that. You know, I played in that famous game when clown when he called him the clown, didn't he? Um, <laughs> Brian Clough called him the clown. Tomaszewski yeah. hit him everywhere, didn't it? Hit him on the knee, on the knee, you know. And the goalkeeper. Yeah. It's, was it one one, one one? Was that one? It one, was one one. Yeah. yeah. But we went out on away. You know, we lost because of away goals or something. We lost two nil in Poland, didn't we? Yeah. And that was the only game that Alf dropped me, you know, because it, it, was, it wasn't easy to get into Alf Ramsey's team. Right. You know, but when you got in, you know, providing you did everything. You'd you look after you. You, you. you were there for good. And I always remember him coming to me, I remember at Katowice in, uh, in Poland. And he said, uh, I'm, Mick, I'm going to leave you out today because I want to play um, Peter Story and, you know, an extra defender. Right. And, and after that, Alf came to me, after the game, he came to me, he said, I made a mistake. He said, we should have, we should have had a go at him, you know? There were games, though, when horse racing came into it. What, what was the story about trying to check results at half-time and things oh, like that? That was after, that was a horse called Man on the Run. We had a, I had a horse called Man on the Run that was running somewhere. It was at Tottenham. It was a Tottenham game, and, and 
um, quality team. And Brian Moore was the commentator. Right. And I said to him, I said, I think the horse runs about quarter past three and kickoff was three o'clock. I said, if it's one, give me the old thumbs up, will you? <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm all over that side, you know, with about 20 minutes gone. And I look up to him and he's gone. <laughs> but no, that was. Would that, that have encouraged you to play harder or be a no, bit depressed? But people think, I don't know, have you got to be totally, you know, can't you have fun playing football? Can't you have a laugh? You know, it was, you know, the competitive side of it. Yeah, you, I mean, you'd do anything to, to win the game while you're out on the pitch. But once the game's over, any sport, I mean, geez, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a good loser in that. And, you know, we're. But I think that you learn to you learn to lose. You think, wow, well, what can we do to make it better next time? Yep. You know, how do how do we not lose? You know what I'm trying to say is, yep. and I think that uh, you know that you know that's this, the thing with horse racing. Jeez, if you if you're not used to losing, you shouldn't be in this game. That's for sure. You know, this this is tame lions. Now tell me, tell me about this painting here. Well, Pneumatic, who cost there you go. 65 guineas. He cost 65 guineas, and he was given to me Bill Whiteman. He, he oh, was one of my first, yeah. one of me, and that's the, that's the picture he gave me. As I said, I always had horses with Bill Whiteman as well, you know, when I first started, because that was right next to Southampton, you know, and that's where we used to live, Bishop's Wharf, and just yeah. outside, so. Great yeah. days. We know how hard it is to be top of the game in one sport you've now done it in two you see you came to West Billsley in 1990 um a stables that the Queen trained at uh, for Mick Shannon she the owned she owned yeah um yeah rather than trained at um uh for Mick Shannon the footballer how did you feel inside about then training racehorses at a stable that the Queen owned well <sighs> I was very lucky if you go and go into the training. I started training. And, yeah. I was 30, I was 36, 37. And like in football, you know, say, when did you give up? I didn't give up football. Football gave me up. And I got to, you know, I, I wasn't as You'd quick as I forever, was. Yeah. You know, I mean, playing football was easy for me. It was good fun. It was me against you. And, you yeah. know, what I'm trying to say is, I, I had you to, would I win had, most of the time. You know, that's what I say. <laughs> you, had to, you had to get it right, you know. You, I had to score goals. I was, uh, you know, the top scorer in the first division in them days, first division, for about six or seven years on the bounce. You know. Was, so, there, a, was there a moment just towards the end of your career where, where you thought to yourself, I'd have scored that two years ago or I'd have scored that last year or... Like, did you realise, or does it? Is, no, do other no, people force the realisation? No, because I think when you in any sport you develop. I, I was in the early days. It was my speed that got me. Yeah, uh, you so know, me too. What's me. Name, you know, <laughs> <laughs> why, but why it, is that but, funny? Yeah, no, but it was. It was because I was quick and I was on things. You know, but as you know, to last as long as you did, you had to start thinking. Now, why am I quick? You had to, and I, I ended up playing for Norwich, and I was more of just a a big lump of a centre forward up up the front who, who had a little bit of guile about him and could right. could make things happen and we had some good young players around us and we, we won the milk cup with norwich and we had a great run mm. at, at that time you know you were in the we, hall of fame in norwich am i really yeah good well i think so i think yes i am you. i think yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever that means so <laughs> well it's better than not being in the hall of fame <laughs> so anyway coming back you so you you end up at Stables the Queen owns. I mean, that's yep. something pretty special. Yeah, well, it is because I knew, you know, we knew all about, you know, West, you know, West Ilsley. You know, it was like you never ever thought I would. But I was lucky that I started at Lambourne in a smashy little place and I bought Saxon Gate off Foot Warwin. You know, it was only a little yard and I eventually sort of built a house. But we got going. We decided that, you know, to get going, it was no good getting going you know, trying to have a derby winner and thing. So we all we'd bought, you know, me and Jill Richardson then, we, we had to buy something that could run. So we've, our first thing was to buy sp sprinters, two-year-olds, mm. you know, and I mean, everyone's doing it now. That's the, no, that's you the thing. You find a niche though, don't you? That's but what I'm trying to say is, and that got us going, you know, and I think in our first year we had 16 or 17 winners 
and and I was lucky enough that uh, um, that Aziz Mirza, who, who uh, took a shine to me and sent me a couple of Ahmed's horses, and the basically the, the rest followed on, you know. But it's Bintalel who takes command and storms to the front in second place, being hard ridden, trying to get on terms. Is Pippa Long, but she's not going to catch her rival today. Bintalel strides clear to win the Queen Mary. I think winning is everything. I think any. I don't so that, care. I don't care. Winning is. Any, what you I get. don't care whether it's a selling player or a Group One winner. Winning, we we all like to to win. Tell me what <laughs> some of those trainers are really like. Come on. I mean, you've obviously know, Old Man Hannon, Ellsworth. I mean, these are some of the biggest characters in the business. Oh, I mean they. I mean they're two. Of, well, they, they're my mates. You know. I. I mean I. Ells, I was me and Els, We used to swap horses. He had one of mine. I had one of his. It was funny, he retired like this year, and he said, that horse is no good that we had, Mick, I'll give it away to someone up north. I says, oh, oh yeah, I says, that's fair enough then, Alzi. Anyway, I'm watching the telly, well, only about three weeks ago. The next thing I see, this horse has come from last, the 60s icon, Wallop, and wins. And they've backed it from 25 to 1. <laughs> you didn't to, get the call? To 30 to 2. So I ring him up, I ring him up with no answer. <laughs> <laughs> and it, anyway, he's, he did ring me back. He said, "Honestly, I knew nothing about it." He said, "I gave it away to the to the farrier, you know." So, but that that was Elsie. But I, I've I've had the same sort of times with with Richard as well. Richard Hannon is, I think he's a, he's my hero because he's he's a bloody good businessman. Um, he's a, he was a great trainer. He he trained he tra he was champion trainer without without an Arab in the yard. Mm. When you think about that, that that is something real yeah. special. So Hannum is a like a proper mate, even though he's a rival. Is that is that? Oh bad? yeah, absolutely. They both were. Right. They both nicked the sugar ate your tea. Huh? Yeah. But that's the way. That's like that's sport. That's anything. But we're good friends. I mean, we. If you had a big we, winner, they'd be on the phone. Oh, absolutely. Straight away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, or we beat each other. We have a laugh about it. You know, yeah. it's good fun to beat to yeah. beat one of them, or you know. Elsie had retired, and when we won the when we won the the Cambridge the other day, he rang up. He said, "Do you want me to pick the prize up?" <laughs> I said, "You better ask the owner. He's with you." Because I was I was isolating because I wasn't allowed to to, to go racing. But yeah. you know, but that's the type of thing it is. We've always got on. So it, there seems to be a little theme, though. Obviously, in in football, you're in a team. Now you might think you're the best, and they're going to pass it to you because you're the king or whatever. But you're in a team. It, it appears that training, you, you feel it was quite isolated, but I feel like you've quite enjoyed the team aspect almost in racing as well, the, well, the rivalry. It's, the, it's so. the competitiveness yeah. side of it, I think, but, that, but that's what life is about, isn't it? You know, that's what gets you up in the morning. You know, that, Richard Allen and David Alzer used to get me up in the morning. I used to, used to think, well, I've, got, I've got, <laughs> very often, <laughs> but you still, but hey, that was the rule. You very often wake up with a hangover, but you always went to work. Yeah. Not like today when a lot of them don't think, oh, I'll have a sickie, don't they? No wonder the country's in a mess, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and this is the mighty Yumze. That's the Yumze, yeah. He was annoying, frustrating, but by, did he give you, you got up every morning, that's why you went to work. Yeah. I would say, if you, if you ask him, he's had a great life. He's done exactly what he wanted to do. He tried to beat, those horses in the ark. He didn't. He didn't stop. I think he was. A, he was a great character. Let's talk about Yumze. He was you because he was a talented character. Yeah. Well, Yumze was. Let's just. I call for those a, who don't know, I let's call just remind a, them. Yeah. Three seconds in the ark. But let's not forget a Group One. Horse, like oh, a yeah. Group One winner, he knew how to win. Oh yeah, um, he, he won the the Grand Prix de Paris. You know, see, people forget that the year before he was three years on the trot second, but the year before he was beaten in the pre Neil half a length by Rail Link. Yeah, because I always wanted to run him at two mile, and and Jabber wouldn't. He wasn't allowed to run above a mile because he said he, he would have no value as a stallion. Well, he yeah. didn't have a lot of value as a stallion anyway. He was just a great little horse. I always remember ringing up Richard Hughes and saying to Hughesy, Hughesy, I want you to ride the horse in the, in the Voltager. I said, we'll win, and he, this horse will win the St. Ledger. And he went, really? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we went to York, and anyway, and he produced him right there on the line, you know what I'm saying? He got his head in front on the line, he won the Voltager. 
I said, this horse will win the St. Ledger. And they wouldn't let me run him. That's why we went to the pre-Neil and finished second to rail link, but we weren't in the arc. So, you know. But you, you see, we would... See, see Jabber was... Jabber was I, fun. Jabber was fun. I, I love Jabber. <laughs> no, yeah, we used to disagree. God. Tell us the story about the, <clears throat> the, the headgear with you, Mze. <laughs> well... Yeah, he kept saying, oh, he needs blinkers, he needs blinkers. I said, he don't need blinkers. I said, he's just honest. But in, before that, I'll just go back with you, because yeah. I had a bad car crash. After his first yeah. one, I, I was in a, in a bad crash. Where I always remember I was over the house, and, and um, I, they said, we're going we're gonna to do the same as we did last year, Dad. We're going to work him at Newbury, you know, 10 days before the arc. I, I said, yeah, because Michael and, J and Jack were, you know, taking control of it because I was in bits really so I, I remember I remember them wheeling me down there f you know for the for the work day we had a horse called um Alfred the Ordinary right he was selling plate useless and we used he was his lead horse and we went down there one day and I always remember you know you know Michael was more or less in charge and Jack was you know a little bit younger then and he's and he, he come running up to me he said God, he, he said he's worked dreadful, Jack. He, he said he only beats, he only beat Alfred the ordinary head. I said, Jack, he's worked <laughs> well. <laughs> he went to the Ark and he got beat by Zakava, didn't he? Christoph Simeon's brought Zarkava inside the last furlong to take it up, and it is the invincible Zarkava who is going to maintain an unbeaten record. A smashing filly has won the Ark. Yumzane was second. Let's go back to Jabba. He 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 says. Headgear, you do what? Oh, Jabber says, I've got to have headgear. So anyway, f fair enough. So I says, right, get me those <laughs> visors, you know? So they brought me the visors, and I've cut the visors, <laughs> cut the visors down, and it was, it was just a wafer fin there. It was a hood, it was basically a... Uh, it, it's like it, a headscarf, really. It, it was, it was <laughs> it, it, nothing. And, and then we run him, and he finished sec second to the horse of John Ox, is what was it? Good horse, see the stars. You see the stars in front, Hume Zane's coming through to try and take second place, but he is the brightest star, see the stars won it, Hume Zane is probably second for the third consecutive year. When you announced your retirement, you made a point of saying that there are a lot of things that happen in life that people don't see, they just see Mick Shannon, the incredible sportsman, and now the Group 1 winning trainer. Um, Health is one thing. Your accident you mentioned with Tim Corby. Let's let's just talk about those because because you've gone through the mill. The Mrs. Jill, you know, is not well. She's she's got cancer. Yeah. You've been in a car accident which killed your best mate Tim Corby. Yeah. Was that what you were getting at? Like there's for all that you want to win, you want to be the best at football, you want to win every race. There is oh, more to definitely. being alive. Oh, absolutely. Your health is everything. You know, and uh, listen, but that's why along the way. You mustn't say you, you, if you want to do something and you can do it, go and do it. Go and have a good time. Tell me about the day of that car crash. Tell me, tell me the memory you have of that day. We were at Doncaster Sales, you know, and um, when we left, and just before we got on the motorway, I thought I'd had a few phone calls I, and, and I said to Tim, do you fancy driving? Yeah. You know, because I've got a few calls to make and I'm, you know, anyway, I made a few calls. The next thing I know, I've fallen asleep. Tim Corby, who's the fellow we're talking about here, he was, um, blood, he was, he was one blood, of your mates, yeah. an owner of racehorses. Yeah, yeah. Loved the game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great character. Yeah. Great, uh, you know. And we think he had a heart attack at the wheel, yeah? They, they reckon he had heart failure. They reckon he was dead before the crash. Can you remember the crash? No. I can't remember a thing about I remember being cut out. That's the only thing. And I remember someone saying to me, just breathe, Mr. Shannon, just breathe. Well, I went, I am breathing. I always remember someone saying, uh, we got a fatality here. And one of the fellows says, keep quiet about that for a minute, you know. But I knew it wasn't me and I knew it wasn't Jack. Yeah. So it had to be Tim, yeah. you know. Um, then I, the, only, the only other thing I remember is then, I remember him cutting out and I remember just being lifted onto a, something, and they took me there by helicopter to the, to the hospital, and then someone shouted out, Buckingham Palace are ringing. 
want to know how Mr. She you know, so something like that. Yeah. that. And, and I thought, and, and someone said, oh, somebody taking the <laughs> somebody <laughs> said. And, and, and it, w it was the lady in waiting of the Queen's rung up the hospital to see how I was. Do you think you changed after that? Did that change you as a person, that experience? Do you think it, it just... Uh, I think what changed me, what changed me was... Uh, we go back a little bit further than that. When, when my, wo my wife first had breast cancer, and um, I saw what chemotherapy done to people, you know? She was great, and she was going to the hospital, she had her chemo, and she'd come home, and for two weeks, she was just a... Finished. Yeah, just... And then, all of a sudden, you could see a change, you know, in, in three or four days, starting to get better, and they say, we're going to do it again. We had to have it four times. Yeah. But you've gone through that yourself, the cancer. Yeah, well, that's right. I had that, tu that tumour, which was... Which we didn't know about. The great thing was, you know, we knew I, I had to have some, had something removed, but we didn't, we didn't know until they had operated. And I always remember my wife saying to me about six months later, she, she said that um, he was, a, he was a real character, the surgeon, and uh, she, you know, and he saw her out after I, you know, when I was coming out, out of all the surgery that I had, and he said, all I can tell you, Jill, is I've got everything. Do you know you've been a legend? Do no, you know I that? no, I don't. I'm very proud of, of, of what we've done, but I haven't done it alone. I've had to do it with, you know, with a lot of very good people. I've, I've had lots of little hiccups and, you know, car crashes and, you know, cancer operations and all those types of things that have keep knocking you down. But, but that's, that happens to everyone. It's how we handle it. And really, my life, I've had to handle what's come my way. Yeah. And, and I, listen, I'm proud of, of what we've done. We've had nice things. We've had a great life, you know, and, you know, from now on in, I'm going to try and enjoy it as much as I can. Well, hey, getting old is not, not fun. Let me tell you that. I'd like to get my hands on that <laughs> He said life begins at 40. <laughs> uh, wouldn't you? I'll tell you that now. Know. But look, I think I want to close by just saying, I think I speak for most people when I say, you were a world-class footballer, a classic and Group 1 trainer, but most importantly, a Group 1 bloke. So thank you very much. Pleasure.